We were almost born ready. <laughs> born ready. Cool. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, very nice to see a lot of you here, and some are still dropping in. So uh, feel free to, to sit down and relax and enjoy for, for a while. Uh, my name is Sofia, and I'm from Agile 42 today, acting a little bit as your host. And I'm going to take care of all the good questions and comments that you're going to provide to us today during the webinar. Uh, with me today, I have uh, Jeff Watts from uh, Inspect and Adapt. Uh, he's going to join Andrea Tomasini from Agile 42 and speak a little bit about leading remotely today. Um, and we wanted to do this webinar a little bit in a different way to the previous ones for you guys who have been in the Agile 42 webinars before. We want to have this more as a conversation today than uh, a lecture if I may use that word. So we are very much looking forward to you being very active with us today, asking a lot of questions in the Q&A and also using the chat to, to communicate with us. So yeah, and before we're gonna start, um, I will also mention that in the chat, you should set the settings to panelists and attendees so that it's fun for everyone in the room to take part of your comments uh, so that we're also transparent in that way. And we are recording this session for anyone who is missing out on today's live session. You can always have a look at it also later on and you can share it with friends and colleagues as well. And I think I should start off with the poll that we prepared now so that we see where to where to start off the discussions today. So I'm going to launch the poll now and then I'm going to give over to Jeff and uh, Andrea. Does the poll come up on that? Yeah, there's a poll right now. You're not allowed to vote, mate. <laughs> Don't cheat. The audience My daughter got to do her first polling card today. So we have some elections in the UK. This is the first time she's going to be allowed to vote. She's oh, very cool. <clears throat> she has no idea who she's going to vote for or what it's all about, but she has the chance to vote for the first time. So, so we, we think we're probably going to talk about a few topics and maybe um, just figure out where you want to start and then once we've started we'll see where it goes see if there's any chat or questions and we'll, we'll follow the flow high participation rate high turnout rate yeah so a majority majority seems to be wanting to start off with the well-being part today yeah <clears throat> it's a big topic how's your well-being andrea at the moment i'm pretty squished <laughs> I was just saying this uh, this morning, I realized in the last seven days, I've been training five. Wow. So I should uh, complain with you, Sophia, and uh, the other spices to Sorry. be a na nasty planner and put me five days of training in seven. It is one of the big topics, well-being right now, not just from a leadership perspective, but just... Yeah. I've got physical aches and pains from from being here and we've talked about we were talking today weren't we about whether we have a little um mini treadmill underneath our desks and things because we're not getting in the steps that we used to um, oh yeah. so you're already going jeff go ahead keep on talking well, about well-being i think there's but there's the, there's the physical side of things yeah <clears throat> where even when we were in offices we were going up and down flights of stairs and we were going from the train station or the car park or whatever, but now we're doing much less physical movement, which which has an impact. But it, I think the bigger aspect is the, the mental well-being, and we were touching on a little bit of yeah. just social exclusion. Um, the more we the more we've disconnected from people, the more it affects our, our mindset, our positivity, our feeling yeah. of connection. And we start to, it, it quickly becomes a negative spiral um, where we start, thinking the worst of the situation. We start getting really suspicious about what people are saying about us or what's going on with everyone's talking except us and that kind of thing. Um, and from a leadership perspective, just knowing that your people are out there feeling that kind of stuff and really not knowing how you can really, really help. That's that's what I'm getting a lot from, from the leaders that I'm working with. How can I help these people? Yeah. I think that is definitely, I mean, there's really two aspects about well-being is a psychological one, which isn't tricky. Um, and um, also the physical one. I mean, the fact that we are forced to watch to the camera and uh, to the monitor and we tend to keep the same distance 
all the time is uh, is tiring the eyes and uh, it in the long term will probably in also reduce our capability to adjust focus and and you know and see things from close or far away so the eyes get also very tired and lazy because we always have the same distance so we should really build into our daily routine when we work uh, uh, probably every hour um, at least 10 minutes where we just stand up and and do something else which doesn't mean looking at your mobile phone because then we don't solve the problem but really try to go wa watch outside look in the distance or try to read books and things like that hmm. yeah so we already put, got something in there at the, at the chat window about moving from meeting room to meeting room that that was a, that was a big thing and I was, who, who was a comment before i was talking to you the other day but somebody said a strange situation where these meetings are 50 minutes long rather yeah. than an hour but even even in the physical world i started seeing people actually building in buffer breaks um uh, ashton's on the course she used to call it shuffle time um, yeah that just get, and building that into your day consciously saying well i'm not going to have back to back to back to back to back to back meeting even more important when you're here and from a leadership perspective role modeling that um and, and being quite explicit that 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 is a good thing yeah using um parkinson's law if you like you know, rather than letting it rule you of it, if you've only got 50 minutes we're going to do the best we can in 50 minutes rather than just going for an hour and making it last an hour yeah i think also at google they call this speedy meeting mm -hmm. and uh, it means basically you can't book the whole hour you can maximum book 50 minutes in an hour so you always have the 10 minutes slack that you that you can pile up and i think uh, I mean, I think when we were in physical environment, we had the chance really to move, go to the meeting room, maybe pick up water or coffee, chitty chat in the corridor. So all of this time also from a psychological perspective allows you to actually disconnect from the topic and your brain has the time to adapt to the context switching. So it's probably changing also, helping you adapt new behavior and different attitude before you jump into the next topic. And uh, today the risk is really with uh, remote meeting that you are continuously online and you never have a time to disconnect. And this creates a lot of stress, uh, mental and psychological stress. Mm. Also, the lack of changing context, I think, is uh, uh, very hard for us in terms of well-being. Uh, being. So we spend, I, I don't know you guys, but I remember the 13th of March 2020, the lockdown started in Germany. And since then, I only traveled twice and my normal schedule would include around 200 days a year of traveling uh, for work reason. Um, and uh, since the 13th of March 2020, I only traveled two times. And uh, if, you're, if you are used to it and you are uh, having building a, a routine around, I, I am alone on the plane, I am offline, nobody can interrupt me then i have my maybe even 30 minutes 40 minute quality time so i had the time to read books to do all those type of things uh, even during the day and now all of that is gone it's not uh, you know it's not anymore there so you need to build another routine that allows you to have those uh, 30 minutes like putting blockers in your calendar or or making sure that nobody takes away uh, that time from you yeah. yeah i think those is, is just an example another thing is that I miss a lot or is affecting me uh, significantly is the fact that uh, before we were used to, to move around and change environments. So in terms of adapting behavior and attitude and understanding what my role in a relationship would be, I always had the chance to look at people and understand based on the context, even the closing, um, which type of role I am and subconsciously I was able to adapt. And now, I mean, we are at home in our four walls and we work and live with our family in the same four walls. So it always takes a while before you get off of this thing and go out. We also have friends and colleagues who actually dress up like they will go in the office. They go down, they walk around the building, they come up again, they go in the office room, they work the whole day. And then in the end, they close down the computer, they go again down, they walk around the building, they come up, they change themselves as house closes and then that going up and down and having this five minutes walking around is helping unwinding and uh, adopting to the context change again which is kind of interesting
those rituals are really really powerful <clears throat> just getting yourself into a different mindset yeah we, we've, we've lost a lot of those rituals those triggers uh, and it's very easy to just let things blur it might seem a little bit a little bit strange but i think that again is where from a leadership perspective we can role model these things by sharing that you know that that we might think oh, people might think i'm a little bit weird if i if i get dressed up or if i deliberately walk around the block just but no it's it's saying that this is something that's working for me why it's working for me and, and you know you have permission to do something yeah um the we've got things coming through in the chat window about standing desks around these different different things that you can do monitors moving around um even even little things like um vitamin d tablets so, Things like that, just make sure that you're getting enough vitamins that you're not normally using a lot. Of. But I'll, I'll, something that that really works for a lot of the leaders that I've been working with is, is this this difference between checking in and checking up. And that's I think for a lot of people it's been quite a an eye opener in terms of how much do I actually trust my people. It's really forced them to think: Do I trust my people? Not are they trustworthy? Do I actually trust them? I might say I do, but now I can't see them. Now I can't just go over and hover. Now I can't call them into my office. Do I? And when I'm when I'm calling them up, what am I asking them? Am I looking for progress reports? Am I looking for status reports? Or am I checking that they're okay? Because if I genuinely trust my people, I don't need status reports because they are doing as well as they can do. And I can only get them to do better by helping them be better. So if I can make sure they're okay, then I will get better results. That that's quite a big uh, and genuinely have people with with little um, sort of affirmations, if you like, behind their monitor, behind their screen that says "check in, not check up," just yeah. to remind them. Because it's so easy to say, "How are we doing? How are we doing?" If the pressure's coming on me, for me to transfer that pressure onto other people. Yeah, we even tried uh, in some cases to encourage people to have informal conversation and uh, just to change the environment, even perhaps just take the phone and go out with your mobile phone and have a 30 minute walk while you talk to another person just to change the, the scenery, just to give you a little bit more movement. And we try even to forbid to talk about job topics and uh, some leader I'm coaching, they say, well, it's great. But as soon as we start talking, immediately people ask things about the work, even if I don't want to talk about it. And, uh, and I say, well, it's normal because they don't know you other than as, as a boss or as a leader in the organization. So they don't have any other topic. So you should ask questions like, what is your hobby? What do you like to do outside of the work? Uh, do you have a family or things like that? So you, you should try to create a little bit more of a check-in feeling of, you know, I want to know who you are. And also I want to know how you are. And that's, uh, it's very difficult. The, the thing I think working remotely requires us to be much more capable and much more focused in using our human skill as opposed to our art skill for work. It's even, even if theoretically you would say we are not physically present, so we don't have that human contact and uh, we don't need to use much our human interrelationship skill. Actually working remotely requires us to use a lot more because we lack senses to perceive uh, uh, so we don't even see the whole body language, so we only see, you know, this piece or even sometimes that piece. And sometimes we don't even see that because people are not comfortable uh, having a video on. So it's extremely difficult to gauge what is that person doing? How is that person doing? How is she feeling? And we have to be very explicit about that. Off you go. Yeah, no, just you mentioned about cameras on and, and that's a conversation that I was having the other day about cameras on because it's something that really i was doing a workshop for, for a client and there's 120 people on there or something it was mostly around retrospectives but the, the one topic that they couldn't get past was most of our people really resist putting their cameras on and I said, so well, tell me a little bit more about you know why do you want people to have their cameras and say well you can see them you get the body language that you don't pick up you've got a richer bandwidth of communication you know you can have a little bit of eye contact and i said i can get all that stuff um, but don't you think that says more about you than it says more about them? And so well, what do you mean? So why is it so important for you that their cameras are on? 
do you believe that it's possible to have an effective retrospective or meeting without cameras being on? And the default was, no, no, I don't know. I don't think it is. I said, well, if I told you that I've had effective meetings without cameras on, even with people that I've never met, and yet we've still managed to have a successful meeting, would you believe me? So well, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Thanks. Don't call me a liar. Um, that's good. That's a good start. Uh, so, but, but think about it. Take it to a real extreme, right? Even if you were physically in a, in a meeting room together and you've got someone who's blind, do you think that meeting can no longer be successful? Because it's effectively the same kind of thing. It's a lack of visual communication. It's not. But the focus on the meeting needing cameras on was letting them, was misleading them effectively, taking them down a different path to, well, what is it about that? And actually, if, if they're away from the consumers put in the chat here, people are physically there, but they're on their emails or they're, they're, they're on Slack or whatever at the same time. Whereas if you're not, if you're out walking with your headphones in or whatever, you've got to listen to the, to the words, right? And so it'll deepen your listening, perhaps. Then, yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's really more about uh, staying focused and there, and that's very difficult. I mean, when we used to be in physical meeting and we had our laptop down and we were even standing or interacting with the physical object like markers or, or post-its or things like that was 100% focused there, right? Sometimes someone would pull out the phone and you immediately would go like, hey, put it away, it's not the break time. But now we are sitting in front of the monitor and the computer is on and you get outlook pop-ups and calendar reminder and chat here and chat there and it's almost impossible to pay attention for a longer uh, time span and this is also what is contributing to higher level of stress there's a lot of people who are used to work with their computer uh, the whole day um, think about developers or, or, or stuff like that but i think is a bit different because it's a lot self-managed is a lot kind of self-contained and controlled. There's a lot of chat going on, but it's more like it's all focused on the same, we have to develop the product type of thing, while leader get continuously interrupted and pulled in in different things, even unattended, and that creates a significantly higher amount of stress. Also not being able to follow a conversation because continuously a pop-up goes around, and this is for many people very, very uh, stressing lately. Mm -hmm. So and I don't really know if there is anything we can do about that and, uh, you know, and saying just shut down all the application and, and focus only on what is happening online and look at the person on the other side. But I think uh, part of what you said, and I was saying before, having 30 meeting, minute meeting and take your mobile phone and walk around and uh, you can't be distracted. You have your iPhone, you are walking, you are maybe looking at the video. That's the only thing you have. So you. You can't really, you know, have millions of pop up and interruptions and all those kind of things. So there's a lot of stuff that are increasing significantly the mental stress. And over time, I think what we are not realizing yet uh, is that is taxing on us. So even if we think now we are more used to it because we went through it for a long time, in reality, I think uh, uh, we are developing a lot of, uh, of stress which might not be manifesting in way we are used to, but in different ways, like uh, difficulties in sleeping probably, or being more on the edge for many things, uh, or just becoming apathic because you are so much in this routine. Hey guys, what different is there between a Friday and a Saturday or, or a Sunday? Who is enjoying weekends? I mean, what the hell can you do? You can't, we can't do, we can't do really much, right? And it's so, it's, I know a sentence that Jeff used to say is it, what difference does it make? It's just another day in the week. Well, so you, you said a minute ago, I'm not sure what we can do about it. But I, I, the one thing that I, I really implore the leaders that I coach to do about it is to really, really think about what they're role modeling. So, for example, are they sending emails on a Saturday? Are they, are they sending emails eight o'clock on a Friday night? Uh, are they multitasking during a meeting? Because people, will pay, people pay a lot more attention to what people do than what they say. And it's, it's kind of one of those things where leaders in the past have almost worn it as a badge of, of honor. You know? I, I, I work 14 hour days or 16 hour days or whatever. And there's no, but now it's so difficult for people to, 
to, to separate those home and work life lines, that it's really important that they role model that kind of stuff. And, and actually the vulnerability side of things as well, of saying, do you know what, it is, it is tough. And, and I've always used the, the, air, the airline analogy of fit your oxygen mask before you fit other people as a leader. You can't care for somebody else if you, if you haven't got the energy yourself, if you're, if you're not feeling okay. Um, yeah. While it might feel a bit selfish, actually role modeling that self-care is a good thing to do for your people. But how quick do you have to be to respond to things that distract you during the day? Because some people probably remotely want you to react like this on something. And some people understand that you're doing something else, right? So how quick do you need to be? Well, that's a really good point. And there's no real, in, in many ways, I, I, I tend to start with, there's not really that much difference between now and then. I mean, obviously there is. But if you, if you really strip it back, there isn't really. Because there'd be times in the old days, BC, when I was sat at my desk in an office, and Andrea comes over and he interrupts me and I said, shut up, I'm in the middle of something. But he would know, or I've got a little flag on my monitor that says I'm okay right now, or I'm, you know, I'm in the zone, or I've got my headphones on. So I've got little signals that I can put out to people to say, yeah, yeah, this is fine. And so teams have developed their own little rituals, whether it's their own status in Slack or collaboration times between this, this time and this time. But yeah, the, the point of what I'm waffling on about there is it's even more important for us to have those conversations about so, so how do I know that if I'm just checking in with you, that I'm not actually interrupting you and ruining your, your day and your flow? Mm. Uh, that Because you don't get as many pull requests or as many visual signals as you used to. So have well, conversations. I'm, I'm not. Yes. And I think uh, there is also another component, especially for people who weren't used to work remotely at all. And they're getting familiar with all these new tools and so on. The expectation is, and that's the problem is that you you are using Slack is a chat client. You're expecting you writing a check a Slack message and someone replies you immediately. Otherwise, you would write an email if it wasn't urgent, right? And there is this expectation of immediate response, and uh, this creates also a significant amount of stress and is interrupting a lot. So you cannot have Slack and switch off notification because people go like, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing that? Right? We have Slack because we want to have immediate response. But then it, it becomes a, a kind of addiction that you, you communicate very quickly. And we used to have a rule when we still uh, had a, in, in the past a physical environment. It was with email and we said every time you, you reach three email reply in the thread, then pick up the bloody phone and call each other and solve the problem because probably there is something which isn't really clear. So instead of going on endlessly bouncing conversation here and there, probably understanding also in this remote time, if we want to stay focused and be able to achieve value and is important to deliver value because it gives us satisfaction from a human perspective saying, ah, I did it great and gives you this, this feeling of gratification. We need to have explicit rule. We need to agree how are we using these tools. And we have more and more tools to use. There is an education thing, but it's never the tool. The problem is always with sitting behind it. And we need to, to find ways in which we can use the tools for what they can do. And uh, for example, one thing that I always advocate and I really struggle to do it myself is to switch as much as we can on a synchronous communication when it comes to work and use synchronous communication instead for checking in, for example, uh, for having human contact and relationship, for having creative uh, session and things like that. But everything related to uh, work and all this stuff can be done asynchronously, can be done through creating more transparency and allowing people to access information and use channels in Slack where you know, okay, I can go there, I missed, uh, I was three hours in a workshop, I come back and I go like, oh my God, there's like 200 messages. How am I going to ever catch up with it, right? So if people don't use thread, don't uh, make sure that there is a summary at the end, they don't pin the message to the channel so you know this is a decision made, but it's just messy in and out, then it's just a massive waste of time. You go there and you try to find information out of a tool because you feel bad because you might have missed something important. And this is really, oh, is, is creating stress as well. And I think we have to be very careful with it. There's, there's a couple of things in the chat that I want to bring out because I think they're really quite relevant. One is um, from, from Anna Christine. She's 
talks about how certain members of the team you know get a lot of stuff done at different times for whatever reason in the example she gives is small kids right so they'll get stuff done while while they're having their nap or you know and they're go to bed so i'll be working different hours and this has given us that greater flexibility and then that's sort of balanced out with with angela saying you know in, if we were all together we could just verbalize something and the team could solve it like that now we've got to book a meeting or whatever so i think I've, i find that interestingly you've got the, the sort of glass half empty leaders who, who look at all the the downsides around the remote working about how this is all taking longer and you know, people are struggling and people can't be trusted and, and, and that kind of stuff. And then you get the glass yeah. of full leaders who say, oh, yeah, but we can do all this flexibility stuff and we can use all these tools and we can do this, that and the other and asynchronous work and synchronous work together. And it's probably somewhere in between, right? It's it's probably a, a, a conscious conversation about all of this stuff. Um, and, and the expectations of one another change. Yeah. But then it, from going back, from the remote work then to the offices, what do people have to think about when they go back now? Like it's going to be a big change the other way around as well, because from going from office to remote was a change and then mm. going from remote back to the office will be different. So how, how can we prepare for that? Um, you want to go first, Andrea? <laughs> well, only because I want well, to... Well, it's fine. Um, well, first of all, will we ever go back? Really, because uh, I mean, uh, a lot of clients, a lot of leader I'm talking to, uh, they realized there's a, especially uh, here in Berlin, in the in the startup environment, there's always been a massive competition about uh, difficulties to hire people. And the other problem is because they keep on stealing each other people here, uh, all the startups, especially software developers. Uh, the other problem is finding office space big enough to host all of these people. And most of the time you need to have office space in a cool location so that you have a nice uh, uh, environment with restaurant and everything around. So lunch break can be also uh, fun and people are also living close by so they don't have to commute for longer time. Well, if now we find a decent way of working remotely, then all of these problems go away. And we see already now a lot of people are cancelling their massive office space in the city center, reducing it to the minimum, actually paying some money so that uh, uh, employees can buy proper uh, infrastructure and work from home. They are paying the internet, the mobile phone and everything is still cheaper than maintaining massive infrastructure and, and office spaces in, in city centers. And on the other end, you can hire people which are almost anywhere within a couple of time zones and they don't need to commute. So the whole stress of having to get into a car or public transportation, going to the office and coming back. So your day potentially really are from nine to six if you are working or from eight to five, whatever it is. And, and that's it. And you can really stop working at that time. And in terms of sustainability is potentially a better setup than uh, having to go back to the office. And uh, with this, I'm not saying it is better to work remotely than working individually, but consciously, we should also consider the advantages that working remotely brought for some people who really struggle to wake up at five or six in the morning, commute for one hour or two hours to go to their to work workspaces, basically for doing things that weren't necessary. So there are things for which being physically present because we can use all our senses, we can move, uh, we can do better stuff with our end than we can do with digital devices, even if we are very talented most of the time. And, and that is very important when we do creative stuff together and so on. But we have, for example, a couple of clients uh, who already established now, they meet with the team once a week or once every two weeks to do their sprint change, refinement and other things. They go to the office actually, they stay outside if the weather is nice or they go inside with empty room space with a mask and everything and uh, they have their creative session there. And everybody when enters has a package with their own post-it and marker and they are only using those post-it and marker. When they exit, they, they, they throw away the post-it they didn't use. It's a massive waste, but it's safe. But they only do it really when it's necessary. They don't do it in terms of going back all the time uh, to, to the office again. We also have to, to recognize that there is a value from a human side to stay more with the family. Think about as consultant, I mean, flying 200 days a year, 
uh, as opposed to being home every day, it's different, right? As, as, as a joke, when Corona started, we all predicted there will be a lot more of babies in this year or a lot more of divorces. <laughs> One of the two. I'm going to slightly disagree with you, Andrea. Right. Very good. Because although nothing you've said there is, is something I would say is, is untrue, I, I predict that there will still be fully co-located organizations. I still think for some that will be a competitive advantage. I think for some that will be the kind of company they would want to work for. I think there will be some that are fully remote. I think the vast majority will be hybrid. Um, and just, I mean, I, I do get kind of I, I, I overly excited and excitable, I suppose, by some of the you know, the concept drawings for these new hub out of city center buildings that the organizations that I see are, are, are drawing up together um, to, to try and make use of the time when we are together. And it will be, you know, I, again, seeing through the chat here, I, I shook hands with someone for the first time in ages and it felt so good, weird, but good. And, you know, I met, I met up with a couple of friends the other day outside a pub in a beer garden and it was just great to see them in 3D. And I just think we're going, there will be a time where we um, we really make use of that. We, we, we take advantage. We appreciate, probably. Appreciate it, yeah. And we'll, yeah, we'll be very, we'll be mindful about when we do it. We won't just be getting together for the sake of it. It will be the exception rather than the norm for many. But I think that we will, we will really leverage that. Um, the other thing I think I'll say about, in terms of preparing, well, there's an argument of you can't really prepare for something you don't know what's going to what it's going to be yet. Um, but what, what will happen is I'm pretty pretty confident is people will be nervous because it will be such a change. It would be we've got into this temporary new normal, however monotonous and unfulfilling it may be. But then we're going to have to go out of our comfort zones again. It's amazing how quickly we we normalise things. And so, you know, it's weird getting on a train for the first time for a minute for a while. Weird getting on a plane for the first time for a minute for a while. Weird sitting in a cinema for a minute for a while. Everything that we used to think was was pretty normal is going to feel a bit weird to begin with. And human beings are naturally change averse, if you like, from that perspective, yeah. because of the fear factor, because of the discomfort factor. But since work yeah. from home is not something everyone likes to do or feels yeah. comfortable in, what can you as a leader do to make them maybe feel comfortable in that sense? Is something you can... Well, I, I in this case, I, I think there's two things. I mean, some people don't like to work from home, but the reason why they don't like for, to work from home is because they're probably... Um, Either they need to collaborate and we're always thinking about, uh, you know, software development or services, but there's a lot of businesses who, who think about restaurant or production line. You can't work from home. You have to actually go there and do things right. You can't uh, you can't really work remotely. So there are people who don't have the chance to work remotely. They need to go to the workplace to be productive and, and engage. So that's one aspect. The reason why people, many people are stressed about working remotely is because they never designed for it. And I know many people, also some of our colleague, uh, they, they rented a very nice fancy flat in the city center, but it only has one sleeping room and one little guest room. And if both uh, in a pair, in a family are working remotely, then one is sitting on the kitchen desk and the other one is in the guest room on the little bed uh, with the laptop on, on their on their lap the whole day and then you go like okay I, I could buy a desk but where am I going to put it right I don't have the space and that's a big problem and, and the tendency you can see also here in Berlin is already now uh, making a difference making a dent people emptying the office space in the city center the owner are trying to convert them to loft and they are getting even more expensive prices. But what people tend to do, actually, they are going away from the city because they don't need to be in the city anymore. They can have a much better quality of life, a little bit more outside in the green if they don't have to commute every day. And also with the same money, they rent a 60 square meter flat in the city center. They might have a house with a garden and even a swimming pool outside in, in, uh, in the suburbs. And, you know, and that and that is something everybody's thinking about. And I'm not joking. In the past year, 
they sold more sauna, swimming pool, jacuzzi than ever in the past 10 years. Think about it. How many people decided to create at home more comfort or even moved away from their apartment into a house because they said, well, if I have to work remotely, if I have to stay at home, then let's make the home a place where I, I love to stay and I feel home and I relaxed and so on. So there is a very big tendency now of people going out from the crowded expensive area, which will, of course, create a collapse in the in the real estate market at some point because the demand will be less than the capacity. So prices start going down because there's a lot of empty space all over the place. I think it'll be a collapse. I just think it'll be a big shift. We could be yeah. we're about to see the biggest shift in property and where people live for, yeah. for generations. You know, my daughter is turning 19 and she's thinking, well, getting to the point she's thinking, moving out. Well, where does she go? Does, I think living in a big city is going to be, so, know, we're going off topic a little bit. What, what can leaders do here? Um, ask is my simple answer, because everybody's got their own different challenges. Whether, as the people are rightly pointing out, I've got two kids working, you know, homeschooling as well, or um, small kids who, you know, the nursery's been yeah. shut because the chef's got tested positive or whatever. Or you know, I, don't, I don't have space for a desk or our walls are paper thin. So if I'm on a conference call and my husband's on a conference call, we can't really concentrate. Whatever the issues are, as a leader, you've got to treat everyone differently. By, well, treat them the same by treating them differently. Because yeah. meeting their needs and, and making, again, coming back to this, are you okay? Because I, I fundamentally believe that if you're okay, then you'll do good work. That's that, that fundamental operating principle. Yeah, and to go back perhaps to the initial question, what if people don't feel comfortable working remotely? Then. I think we need to empathize with that. We need to understand in which condition are you actually working remotely and eventually perhaps consider renting a, a office space or a, in a shared office space, you know, a working station where close by to the house and just moving out and going out, even if it's 10 minute walk or 20, then go there and work from there. So you are outside of your environment. And then when the work is finished, then you come back again uh, home. So that those are solutions that are actually really happening. If uh, people didn't plan or design to work from home and they have kids at home, great respect. I really, I, 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 we have neighbor here with, with three kids, both working remotely. And uh, I mean, chapeau is one year they are working in with homeschooling, self-learning condition and stuff like that by iterating it's it's great and also for the kid is great because the parents are home all the time but they needed to be educated away they needed to learn that working and leading remotely it's difficult and it's not that papa and mama are at home and then we can jump on them and play with them they needed to understand okay this is work time i'm not supposed to disturb them but it gives another feeling of safety because you always know they are there right but i think we also miss the social uh, content in a way and uh, going back to the leading topics, when we lead remotely, we should be aware of what is the situation on the, of the people on the other side. And also probably role model, as Jeff said before, if you have kids at home and you are a leader, don't be ashamed if your kids come in into a meeting, just empathize with it. And it's normal. It's just the way it is today. So there are kids in your life. It's fine. And they come in while you have a meeting with the CEO. It's also OK. Right. Uh, it is the way it is. Uh, and you have you, your priority is still uh, your family, still your well-being, is still you being a good human being if you want to role model it to the other. So sending your kid away or pretending is not there or doing other funny things is probably worse than actually just accepting the situation as it is. I, I misread a, a comment in the chat there from Jenny saying, I, I thought she'd rest, written, I really miss the, the excessive amount of sweat of in-person meetings, but the excessive mm. amount of sweets. But that, yeah. the, and, and that sort of brings me on to that treating, you know, getting to know people and, and just reaching out to them. Uh, the number of people that I've seen tweeting or posting about the care package they've received, just a little gift. Uh, and the, the best ones are the ones that are a little bit personalized because you know about them um, and, and what, what they would value, just like you know, present is the thought that counts. I think just reaching out, telling people that you know, you're still thinking of them, that you still value them, that and here's something useful, here's a little bit of recognition. Yeah. Appreciation.
And we were we were talking this morning, for example, then I, I mean, one of the biggest problem now, we are impeded in our movement. So we can't travel so easily, we can't go on holiday so easily anymore. And we are suffering because of this. I mean, our body, our mind needs to change, you know, the environment and, and also do some physical movement and so on. And so there are people, I mean, also uh, some of our colleagues, they just bought a cyclette at home and sometimes they are pedaling and they are in the meeting and you see they are wobbling up and down. And this morning with Jeff, we were talking about having a, a small treadmill under the desk and sometimes you stand up and you just uh, walk while you have a meeting. You are a bit wobbly, but there are people who have different needs. So the role of the leader is really to have this one on one check in regularly um, not talk about the work, but talk about hey, how are you doing? What is it that you are missing? You know, how are you feeling? What is it that we can do to help you, you know, be more uh, effective, be more satisfied uh, about the work so you can focus really on doing what you're good at rather than uh, being all the time stressed and, and dissatisfied about the situation and the condition. Peter's asked the question, if we, are, if we are mostly working from home and we don't have to commute, we should, we should be better off. We, we should, so is it the case that we're just not managing ourselves very well or is it genuinely a lack of trust? What do you think about that? Self-discipline needed to be working from home, working remotely. I know there are different things, but similar to what we're talking about today. Yeah, I think uh, one part is the lack of trust, but I think one part is really we are not we are not used to this routine yet. We don't have the protocols. We don't have the acceptance of the fact that it's OK. For example, if this afternoon from two to four, I'm going out for a run, right? Or I go this morning for a run and then I work later. Also, the 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 this stress of having the work time from eight to five or from nine to six. I mean, a lot of company had flexible work time already before. But shifting to remotely, it seems that all of a sudden everything got tightened up again uh, because of the need of having chat messages and, and video call and meeting and so on. So I think we spend a lot of time, probably too much time in doing a face to face meeting on Zoom. And we could probably skip a lot of those stuff with the, some good information and focus more on really meeting when is necessary and giving people more space to organize their own uh, activities around the normal workday instead of uh, being so strict about uh, being online and uh, and uh, having to reply to chat and stuff like that especially international company who are active 24 hours what difference does it make if i'm there from nine to six or you know yeah. at the end of the day it boils down everything to trust as you said before jeff so it does and i, I do i know we've had a couple of people pointing out that this isn't true remote working, this is working from home during the pandemic, it is different. And, and ultimately, a lot of us were in the business of, to some degree, remote working even before a pandemic. It was rare that we were all in the same place. So yeah. um, it's, it's, it's taken it to a real extreme, you know, probably further than where it will be, uh, whatever, whatever the new normal turns out to be. But the, um, this idea of self-discipline it's it's a new set of disciplines it's a new routine that we're having to develop for ourselves when we were working in the office we had certain routines but we built them up over a number of years that we didn't realize that we got into routines and rituals and, and certain things and we created little triggers for ourselves and, and so on uh, and now we've we've been forced to create some more so there is an element of a lack of self-discipline some of it i think is engendered by the role modeling and what we see but also what we kind of expect others are expecting of us if that makes sense so that um i, I may feel i need to to prove more because i know that other people i believe i know that other people are, are wondering if i'm slacking um, yeah or i don't know whether i'm adding enough value so i'm going to try and do more just to, to meet my own definition of success or my own feeling of contribution yeah. um and if i'm not aware of the what's going on for me. And as I said this before, when I was sat next to somebody, I might not realize that I'm getting all stressed and, and tense and frustrated, but the people next to me can. And, and the number of times that people say, Jeff, Jeff, should we just, uh, should we just go for a walk or go for coffee or, or a drink? I don't have that anymore. I've, all I've got is a screen looking back at me. No one really looking out for me. 
So I got to learn a little bit more about myself and not, not really like doing that. Yeah. But I think, I mean, as, as we both shared in our video blog before, um, before this webinar, I think uh, ultimately uh, a good leader is still a good leader. And uh, in principle, we are trying to achieve the same thing. And uh, I think that the job of a leader is still the same, is to create an environment in which people are enabled to deliver the value that is necessary to be delivered and they can find satisfaction in their work. So what change when we do it remotely is that we need to change the practices that we have been using. We cannot simply do what we were doing in physical uh, form, uh, translate it and do it on the video because it's probably not working. It doesn't have the same impact. So we need to find a new way, new practices to be able to engage, to be able to check in as opposed to check up, as Jeff said before. But there are also aspects related to support people learning because shifting the environment to remote, it was easy for maybe all of you or all the people we know that work already with a, with a computer. They, can, they are very uh, skilled in using office tools and things like that. But think about all of those businesses which weren't used to work remoting and weren't used to have a digitalized environment. Uh, they are all discovering now Microsoft Team and Zoom and, and sharing document. And, uh, you know, there are people who are really struggling with all of this new stuff. And uh, we should be aware of it and we should offer them support. And there's a lot of other skills also, I think, from a human perspective in terms of making explicit how you feel in learning how to communicate effectively remotely. Uh, that are necessary in order to be able to lead uh, also remotely. But we need to grow ourselves as leader and learn those things. But we also need to upskill all the people we are working with because it doesn't really help uh, if we learn about those stuff and nobody else knows about them, right? And also what I personally learn at my own expense is that we need to be a lot more specific about things and how we mean them. We need to write them down. We need to document probably a lot more so that people can read things offline. And, and there's a way of agreeing, co-creating a working agreement for remote work, even agreeing how to use Slack and take, taking the time to think about, look, when is a reply in thread, we do like this, we do like that, so that there is a feeling that, okay, now I know what you mean with it because we are doing things in context rather than just using a tool. I, th I think all of these things are eating us now and uh, they will keep on. I think the whole society wasn't ready to this big shift. The whole digitalization complaint that we hear all around Europe or the lack of bandwidth and all this type of stuff are all consequences of the fact that we weren't able or we weren't ready as a society to switch uh, uh, to work remotely so massively all at once. Some people have now in the chat been saying that they haven't even met their teams or colleagues ever face yeah. to face because they have been working remotely. So how can you as a leader tackle this maybe? How can you onboard people well? And how can you build trust with people that you have actually never met? Because it's anyway different doing it over video than face to face, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the people that I've doing some work with recently, um, Claire Donald, she, she does some work at a uh, product company. And we're, we're going to do a presentation actually soon at, at one of the meetup groups on, on the future of work. And her company actually have a really, really good onboarding process, which to build on what Andrea was just saying there is effectively a lot more documentation than we would normally have had. Um, but it's who's, who can, who can you speak to about this? This is where you can find this. These are the links to this. And it's it, it's really, really proven really valuable to, to people who are joining the organization. But we've actually got another question around you know, how do you, this, this trust thing. I'm, I'm probably going to risk saying the same thing again, but perhaps in a slightly different way, which is from a leadership perspective, I was always taught, not just from a leadership perspective, not necessarily formally, my mum and dad sitting me down and telling me this, but it's sort of something that came through the culture, which is people should earn your trust. And I think that's backwards. And I think this has really magnified that and actually starting with trust and saying, unless you prove me wrong, I'm going to trust you. I think that's, that's where I've seen leaders really separate themselves and create 
better cultures within their organizations. I genuinely believe that people want to do a good job. And if they're not doing a good job, it's because the environment isn't set up to help them and enable them. Something's going on. Right? So um, I'm going to trust you. And unless you prove me otherwise, that's, that's where I'm starting. You don't have to earn my trust. I'm giving you my trust. I think that is, it's very important. On the other end, I work with a lot of leaders and not all of them are in the position to do it. And that's another problem. Uh, it's a problem. And we talked about this also today, Jeff, when we, when we share with the people also about the archetypes. So it depends really how, how is the environment, how is the culture in the organization you're working in? If everything is controlled and steered top down, unless you are one of the guys on the top, it's very difficult for you to take the responsibility to say, I give you the trust and I take all the default on my shoulder. Very few people feel comfortable about doing that and creates also stress. So in principle, yes, we need to start trusting if you want people to trust us. And that, and that is, in my opinion, the most important thing from a leadership perspective. What can you do so that your people trust you? Because if they trust you, then you know that you can trust them. And, and you need to start trusting at the same time. So you need to demonstrate trust by creating freedom, by giving them empowerment, by being able to support them when they make mistake and telling them, OK, now what did we learn with this mistake? And help them evolve from their state of fear. But unfortunately, uh, sometimes, uh, and I find out often with the one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, people would like to give trust, would like to allow people to make mistakes, but the pressure they have and the level of control they have from their own bosses and leaders doesn't allow them to create that safety space. And I think safety and trust are particularly important when working remotely. To be honest, there is no way you can supervise anybody uh, working remotely unless you're spending the whole day uh, supervising a single person to, to do what she's doing, right? To look at what she's doing. There are even crazy companies building up tools who monitor what people do on a daily basis in terms of which site did they browse, how many time, how much time they spend writing emails or chat messages, how many time they spend using an IDE or a or office tool environment. I mean, this is madness, right? Told, uh, we, you probably know this more than me, Andrea. I was told that Zoom had a feature, but it's been removed now, which yeah. indicated if you, if Zoom wasn't your active window. So if you were open like messaging or email or something, it would alert. Oh, this isn't an active window. Is that true? I'm not sure. I heard about it. There was some rumor, but I'm not sure that is actually. I don't know if they removed the feature, to be honest. Maybe it's, it's still <laughs> there. We just don't know about it. It's not there now, I don't think. But yeah, they definitely, definitely were. I mean, the companies have. I think it's really so, light on the companies that do trust their people and don't. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, I think we are all needing needing to learn what is going on. But I think there are a lot of stuff uh, that we already said. We also said in the video blog, and and I think those things are important. Uh, working remotely requires a lot more of empathy in some way. We have to be more empathetic with the people on the other side. Try to put ourselves in their shoes. Our behavior should be more driven by curiosity and by the willingness to support people and to help them. Uh, find a good rhythm, a good uh, rituals for working remotely. We should provide uh, all the necessary information so that people feel comfortable. They don't feel isolated and alone. I think, Jeff, you talked uh, largely about this uh, before and also in your blog post. One of the biggest problems we need to try to solve is people feel isolated. They feel alone. Um, their courage and their opportunity to ask for help remotely are significantly less unless they already establish relationship of, of trust with others. So there's onboarding people remotely. It's, it's harder because it's harder to put them in contact with all the other people in the company. And uh, well, what we are doing now, we, are, we have already onboarded, I don't know how many people, uh, probably Lothar was the first one or not even the last one, but we had a couple of coaches. Now other two are coming in remotely. We never met them physically. We just had a couple of talks and we are trying to set up uh, like 30 minute uh, walk and talk uh, things with different employees 
uh, at least twice a week so that they get to have that uh, just personal relationship exchange and knowing about oh who are you and how you look like and what do you do uh, beside working in the same company right so all of these things are things which we need to learn and we need to i think amplify more because this feeling of isolation drives to feelings of incompetency because I don't get help and then I feel frustrated because I cannot finish my job so I get dissatisfied and I spend too much time doing things that I shouldn't spend time with and all of these things pile up in creating more stress less productivity and ultimately a very bad work-life balance because what people end up doing they just work longer and and they work more hours because they still need to prove that they are achieving something or someone has expectation on them and and they are ending up ruining completely their life and and being completely burned out and this is what we should be very careful with yeah. burnout yeah chat comments as well here that people feel tired and people are afraid of being burned out and also afraid of admit it, admitting it to to themselves and to the probably to leaders or team leaders or teammates even so yeah yeah as um yeah just i see this other question from a lesser and i want to as well as just just generally role modeling things i'll, I'll start off with this to good practices about remote team building or team events yeah I'll start off with what i said earlier which is there's there's not really that much difference between where we are now and where we were obviously there is but the the, the principles the fundamentals remain the same and that we're more likely to act as a team if if we know we're if we know a little bit more about each other um, and so just a little bit of getting to know each other but in an informal setting in a safe setting so from a from a practical perspective um user manuals are a really good technique that I've come across just just tell me a little bit about how you work how you operate what gets you going what gets you in a good zone what gets you in a bad zone what frustrates you how can I stop annoying you those types of things um, just a certain level of safety and then just little things that we would normally do I mean I, I don't think this is particularly brilliant but I think it worked quite well um, the community that I'm part of we, we, we hired a musician to come on and do a do a few songs for us uh, and everybody could request a song so you, you know whether you did or not, you, you might not, but you could, uh, we could learn a little bit about musical taste, just sit back, have a little bit of a social, um, and it's replicating a little bit of what we, what we might get. So something that's nothing to do with work, something that's a little bit to do with work, and then giving them a challenge that they can actually achieve and, and, and get that sense of, yeah, we did something together. I think those are the three areas I'd look at. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that. And also this idea of, uh, uh, making explicit what our expectations are normally this would happen in conversation on the on the floor or during the day work and so on but probably facilitating an exercise in which everybody clearly declare this i think is what i can contribute to the team this is what i would like the team to do for me and uh, this is what i think is our mission and our vision or what i can contribute to that mission and that vision and i think making that explicit and just maybe sharing a mirror board with this information can start that conversation and can have the possibility also to get feedback from other and everybody can do their own card and then rotate it and give each other feedback and then build a conversation and create a common sense of purpose and especially when a team is new as Jeff said, never challenge them too much at the beginning. Uh, be empathic with the fact that uh, they are having difficulties. It's not easy for them probably to coordinate and work remotely. So we should start uh, giving them uh, maybe smaller challenges, uh, little things which are probably achieved quickly, but still uh, creating value for the client so that they can start getting excited about it. They start believing it's working. They start, uh, and if you believe in it's working, then it is working because more and more you engage, the more you believe is the right path you're following, the more you're willing to put energy in to make it work, even if it doesn't. And uh, it's different if you start failing from the beginning, then you start blaming everything else around you. And, uh, you know, the internet is not good enough. We didn't talk to the client. It's not my fault. It wasn't my responsibility. It was Jeff's fault uh, because the enemy is always outside. It's never, you know, where we sit. That's the, the biggest problem, I think. Thank you. Guys, we are also running out of time, uh, unfortunately. We have one minute left. So maybe you can give your best tip and trick before we say thank you for the day. Jeff. In 10 seconds. I think I'll, I'll start with pretty much what Andrea just finished with there. 
but from a leadership perspective, is that start with yourself. Not for two S self-care, but also role modeling. Yeah. What do I want to see other people doing? I'm going to do that. Yeah, from my side, uh, not to repeat what I said before and Jeff just repeated, but I, I'd rather, I, I think one of the biggest difficulties w leading remotely is to put ourselves in the shoes of the person on the other side. And we really need to spend purposefully time to do that. We need to get to know the person on the other side. We need to understand how they feel. And we need to go away from managing. We need to go away from checking up we need to start really leading and trying to model those behaviors that we want to see more of and try to dampen those behaviors that we don't like. And we can only do that by having serious one-on-one -on -one conversation about how people behave, not about what they do. So forget about what they do. That is taken care of. They do themselves. Just focus on how do they behave, how do they feel, what can you do to help them behave in a more correct way. Super, thank you. I know there's a lot of more questions probably around leading remotely, but I know you guys are also very active in the community that we have just launched, right? So if people have questions, they can also just pop into the community and, and ask you more questions. True there. story. Right? So we're going to send, send out exactly. some, some Join us at community. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Sorry, join us at community.agile42.com. We will see the link probably in the blog post. Yes, there's going to be a blog post and an email. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. So we will take it from there. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Andrea, as well. Uh, we look forward to see you in the next webinar. Thank you, Fia. No problem. Bye. Take care.